as I understand it, had been told that a deed who was in charge of the Halbergetter clan at the time wanted an Amer a live American. At that point, I'm the only one left alive. And, uh, and I don't know whether that's the reason they stopped beating. I mean, initially they were going to beat me to death. There's no question about it. I mean, they broke my nose, cheekbone, eye socket. They were ripping all my gear off. And I, I, I'm sure that, you know, this was it. And then suddenly somebody's shooting rounds in the air and basically getting control of the mob. And as I understand it, capturing me on behalf of General Adib. Now moving you around, you're in excruciating pain, obviously at this point, just trying to get your bearings. At any point, are you just like, how, are you questioning how did I get in this situation? Why, why me? No, I mean, I, I, and I don't know if it's just my nature, but I'm, I'm, const I'm constantly trying to solve the problem. What, what can I do to solve the problem? What can I do to make this better? And, you know, just, just deal with it. There was no, no why me. It was just, uh, again, trying to revert back to common sense in some cases and then what they had taught us in survival school. And, and that's, so then that's what it is. It's just this big, it's like one, one hurdle after the next. If I can survive this. And do you go through that as surviving instead of, okay, how long I'm going to be here? Oh, but for sure. Break it down if I can survive the next five minutes and that increases. Absolutely. And even once I got in captivity and things settled down, I always said, look, I'm just going to worry about today. You know, you know, to think you could be there for years, I mean, that's, you can't process that, right? And, and so I just said, look, just do what you need to do today. Figure out, you know, how to get nourishment, how to gather more information from these guys if, if you can, because at some point you'll probably be able to share it some way, right? Clean yourself up. I was even trying to do some exercise at one point. There was a windowsill, and I'm, I'm just pulling myself up, trying to get my heart rate up, right? Because knowing if I lay here for, I'll just die from laying here, you know? So all of those things, I came up with one idea. I asked them to wash my brown T-shirt. I figured nobody in this city's got a brown Army T-shirt. If they hang it on the line to dry, maybe somebody will see it, you know, just... Those kind of things are all just kind of running through my mind, how to solve the problem. And uh, ran out of time, but I, I feel like eventually I would have figured out something. Yeah. The Red Cross volunteer comes in, and you get that radio. What, that's that next level of optimism. Right, connection to the outside world, knowing what's going on, or at least the media's version of what's going on. But it was fairly accurate. It was actually the BBC and uh, Armed Forces Network were the two things that you could get on that radio. And uh, it, again, some of it was just morale. They found out I had it and they started playing songs dedicated to me. And some were, songs were, you know, they were actually a connection to it. There was a reason, a rationale for it. And, uh, you know, again, just a little morale boost. Every little bit helps. And you know, maybe you could just forget about your situation for a second and think about, you know, the good time you had six months ago listening to that song in a bar or something, you know. And that's, I mean, at this point you don't know anything about Donovan or Cliff or anybody else, and those songs that were played, it, you still don't think anything's happened. Right. Was it they played those specific songs knowing that, they could keep you focused, would you say? Was that intentional? Did you ever find out if that was intentional? Yeah, I mean, I, well, there was a lot of things going on. Some of them uh, tactical in nature. Mm -hmm. Some of them just, hey, you know, let's let's try cheering them up. Uh, but yeah, there, there there was a variety of reasons why they were doing all that. You were given the Bible, and to have the forethought to start documenting everything. Why was that important to you? Um, it's a little victory. It, 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 you know, they never knew I was doing it. They thought I was reading the Bible, which I was, but they never knew that I was keeping a journal. And, you know, that, that profession is all about executing and then analyzing the execution, improving on it, that execution, and then go doing it again. So to me, capturing this in writing is a tool to help the, we, it's a debrief is what we call it, our after action review. 
knowing we're going to get into this in detail. And now I've got it, you know, written down. This was not memory. Oh, was that nine days ago or 10 days ago? This is that day I wrote this down. This is what happened. You know, so it's very, very accurate and, and informative and valuable. And it turned out to be, you know, had another person been captured, let's say, I think some of that information would have been very useful. And that's the whole idea. They move you around. They don't leave you in one spot for very long. They move you around, and that could have potentially saved your life if you've got other angry Somalis coming after you. Uh, the man that looked over you, though, you got lucky to have somebody that was somewhat caring as far as caring can go in that situation. Ferimbi is who you're referring to. He wasn't at first. He was pretty hostile at first. But... Uh, you know, as we spent more time together, uh, and again, I would credit some of this to what I learned in survival school. They, they, some of what they're teaching you is, is just human interaction, you know, psychology, and it worked. Uh, in fact, the Red Cross described it as reverse Stockholm syndrome. They said they liked me, and you know, I'm not saying I had some master plan to mind for mind control, you know, but. It, the things they taught me worked, and uh, you know he's an example. How I think we got to the point where, if a rescue had occurred, which is in my mind what's most likely here, he's going to at least hesitate before he pulls the trigger, and that might be all we need. We you know the extra ten seconds, where I look him in the eye and like, hey, you know, we're buds. What are you doing? Uh, could have saved my life. And that's the whole, that was the whole strategy that I was trying to use. You had, you may, and I think I jumped ahead, you made, uh, Adid had the video camera and, and they do that, you're thinking, obviously that happened before you got the radio and all that stuff, right. but I mean. Yeah, video exploitation I think is, is something any prisoner is at least concerned about because it, it's like, being interviewed by the media, right? I mean, you can kind of turn it into almost anything you want, depending on uh, you know how many things you say. They can be cut up or abbreviated, or the question changed, or whatever, right? So there's always a lot of concern when you start talking about being videotaped in captivity or under interrogation. So when they first said, you know, we're going to bring a camera, and you know, we're going to ask you some questions, and I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. But in the end, you don't have a choice. I mean, they're going to run the camera, and you can either use it to your advantage or not. And as it turns out, the survival experts will say, that was my proof of life. That, that was, without that video, nobody knows where I am, if I've survived or not, and there's no accountability. But once there's proof of life, now the Somalis are accountable for my safety and survival and as much as you know they're going to comply with the Geneva Convention in a situation like that. And then thus came the Red Cross. And right. The, you know, the doctor and they held on their end of the bargain for right. whatever. So it didn't feel like a good thing when the video camera was running, I can tell you that. You know, again, and I'm reverting back to what they taught me. Yeah. And so you get that letter out to your family um, to get that out and then to hear the response on the radio. Is it another level of optimism? That yeah, unlocks? for sure. I mean, you know, I mean, emotional because I left home one day before my first son's first birthday. I mean, my parents were on their way flying in for his birthday party and we punched out. So, you know, obviously I'm thinking about him a lot and, uh, you know, to find out that, you know, he's okay and he's taking his first steps and those kind of things is pretty pretty significant when you're in captivity, you know, I mean, that probably doesn't happen all that often. You, the guys even find a way to reach out to you, too, through that response. Um, what does that mean, again, to hear their support and to know that they reached out in that response back to you? Yeah, like, I mean, it, the family, they're good. Yep, it boosts, it just boosts your, your morale and, and you know, it's a psychological battle. I mean, I had some major injuries, but in the end, it's a psychological battle. And if you can win even a small part of that battle, then it, it increases your chance of survival. Do they give you any warning that they're going to turn you back over? Or 
you going, oh my gosh, you're moving here again? Yeah, I, I, I was told, but, you know, they can manipulate you just like you're trying to manipulate them. So I thought, all right, if it happens, it happens, great. If it doesn't, I'm not going to let it get me down. I'll get, one, get through one more day. And a few hours later, a doctor showed up from the Red Cross, and he had morphine. And when he injected the morphine, I knew, okay, this is legit. I mean, there, this is not uh, a ruse at this point. And uh, that began the process of my release. You get back to neutral ground. Do you remember that feeling when they open that back and they pretty much, you know, are dumping you there? Mm -hmm. um, it's over, you know, somehow, in a in a much shorter time than I thought it would be. I I, I sort of mentally, even though you know I'm, I'm surviving a day at a time, in the back of your mind, you know, you have some sense of this is not going to end soon, and uh, it was. A miracle, really, that it did.